Good evening, everyone. It had been many years since Samuel Moore applied his old trade. His time as a contract killer was long behind him. These days, as a mortician, the only bodies he dealt with were those that had already passed by some other twist of fate, not his hand. But when a respected client comes to him with righteous vengeance on her mind, he finds it's time to put his old skills to use once again. And now, an excerpt from chapter one. <clears throat> Mr. Hughes was dead, that much was certain. His horizontal form of the mahogany casket indicated that fact clearly. Thick makeup caked to his face, flawlessly hiding the unmistakable parlor of death. His chin and neck had a fresh shave, his head a fresh haircut, and what hair remained had been combed and beautifully positioned. The marks of his death were hidden by a concealer, a fine suit and a striking red tie, a silk fabric much more pleasant than the streak of blood he had once worn in its place from the gouge across his throat. Mr. Hughes once lively blue eyes were closed and calm. His lashes were brushed against his cheeks, suggesting an air of sleep and peaceful dreams. With no sign of the turmoil he faced in the last few moments of his life, he laid in death almost sweetly, his hands carefully crossed at his chest, ready for the mourners who would attend his funeral with prayer and flowers. The sunlight streamed in over his casket, momentarily resting on his visage, a picturesque, angelic sight, dampened only by the haphazard falling of cigar ash onto the cadaver's face. Damn, came a low voice, inhaling smoke. I'm making a mess of my work. The voice belonged to none other than celebrated mortician, Dr. Samuel Moore, who now slowly and deliberately dabbed a cotton round to pick up the ash off his subject's cheek. A decorated alum of Pennsylvania University and owner of the Samuel Moore Funeral Home, Moore had found early on that he had a natural talent for making the dead look lively. Unfortunately, he also had a natural talent for smoking, the desire for which seemed to always come at the most inappropriate times. With over 10 years of experience in his two crafts, he was a veritable, veritable master. And once the subject before him was duly restored, he took a few steps back to admire his work. Mr. Hughes was dead. That much was certain. Now, thanks to Dr. Moore's careful workmanship, he also looked undeniably improved. From several paces back, Samuel paused momentarily at one of the church pews to continue admiring his handiwork. The cigar smoke rose thick into the rafters of the funeral home, dimly lit and somberly still. He pocketed his heavy metal lighter before gazing at the image of Christ on the wall both graceful and comforting. Nothing like a fine cigar and a dead body, Dr. Moore said, smiling. He was both allured and unnerved by the constant scent of death and the strong, sharp smell of formaldehyde that masked it. He felt most alive in the mortuary, a strange sort of knowledge that unsettled him. But a job is a job, and this job was one of grave importance. Dr. Moore was a terrific man to do it, he took pride in his work. There was an unjust nature to death and Dr. Moore always sought to restore balance to the departed. He cared firmly about justice, about restoring the right order to things. Wasn't there a sort of final justice in allowing the living to see the dead one last time as they were in life? Death was inevitable. It was guaranteed. But when one would die and how, these are some of life's greatest uncertainties. The undertaker eyed the flowers around the casket, then looked over to the piano. His eyes looked locked onto the hymnal book as he began to sing in a low voice. It may be my last time, I don't know. Just four days earlier, Mr. Hughes was alive. Mrs. Berlusconi had sat in the quiet office, her nails sharp and red her neck laden thickly with sapphire and diamonds. Her perfectly made up face betrayed a crawling scowl, wrinkling the edges of her cheeks. I want the bastard dead, she said to the figure before her. She was slight, she was old, but she uttered the words with deliberate fortitude. The mortician would normally have laughed at such a request from such a lady, 
but the gravity in her demeanor gave him pause. Why do you want to take his life? The woman bristled, a slight smirk playing at the edge of her lips. You underestimate me. I know I am old. I know I must seem capable of nothing, but I am a proud Sicilian woman, a woman of honor. And I make this request on behalf of my family, the only people for whom I'd ever raise a blade. The mortician arched an eyebrow. I may seem prim and refined, but I was the hellraiser in my day, Mrs. Berlusconi said. Before all these wrinkles appeared, I took matters into my own hands quite frequently. I even had my weapon of choice, a straight razor gifted to me by my father. Dr. Moore opened his mouth to speak, but the old woman cut him off. I have thought about this decision carefully and my family and I have suffered enough. Mr. Hughes has cleaned us out entirely. He conned tens of thousands of dollars from my beloved husband and completely wiped out my son's inheritance. We lost the family business trying to recover from his scam, but my son hit and, my, and his children would do nothing. If I do not act now, my ancestral line will lie completely in ruin. Furthermore, I checked his record. We are not his only victims. There will be others. The man spoke at last with an air of curiosity. Why me? The lady looked him up and down. There is no one better suited to the job. You have the intelligence and the tools to take care of both the act and its aftermath. You have the experience. I know of your past, your days at Penn, but most importantly, Dr. Moore, you've been a dear friend to my family over the years. You've cared for them in death as kindly as I care for them in life. I want justice for my family. I want to see the scales balance in our favor. It is all I will ever ask of you. Dr. Moore straightened his tie. I see we both have a past, Mrs. Berlusconi. We are both accustomed to murder and unaccustomed to fear. He placed his steady hand over hers. No charge for this service. He said his voice grave and clear. This time it's on the house. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Randy. All right, everyone, we have reached the portion of the program where we will be doing